welcome. My name is Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Mallory, Caitlin, and Alan today, and we're talking about La Cucina Toscana. More specifically, something we like to refer to as Fagioli is Love. If there's anything the Tuscans might be famous for other than the fact that Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and Giotto were all born there, and the actual language of Italy is the Tuscan dialect as defined by Petrarch and Dante, the fact that they are mangia fagioli is one of the things that they are most famous for in Italy. And that means they are bean eaters. It is a bean eating culture. They love the whole idea of eating beans and enjoying beans and growing up with beans. And they cook with them a lot and it's very simple to do. And one of the most important things to do is realize how you deal with them. When you buy beans in Italy, you buy them dried. They come like this. It is a fresh produce item at the end of the summer. And they look kind of like elongated beans or peas for that matter. Then what you'll do is you'll take the beans out and you'll allow them to dry in the sun or in something that looks like a granary, a kind of a drying area. And then they just put them away for the year. When you buy beans, it's important to realize that they may be of a certain vintage. If they are beans from two years ago, they will take longer to soak and longer to cook than beans from the most recent year. If you find them fresh, you don't have to soak them. You can just cook them as quickly and as simply as you want. What we've done with these beans here is we've soaked some beans overnight in cold water. Then we've drained out the soaking water. We've put them in a pot. We've brought them to boil. We've lowered the heat to simmer, and we've cooked them until they just start to crack on the outside edge. At this point, these beans are completely edible, and you may use them for soups or just for dressing and serving as a contorno. In Italy, they love the idea of serving beans either as an antipasto or alongside of something, but they also love it in their soups. And the first soup we're going to make is something called ribolita. Now, if you're familiar with the Italian language, ribolita is, of course, the past participle of ribolire, which means to reboil. And why would they have it that way? Well, because this soup is actually the second step in a, a line of five different days of the same soup. Tuscans are quite famous for their thriftiness, so when they make a large bowl of minestrone, a large pot of minestrone at the beginning of the week, or whatever day it happens to be, they'll call it minestrone, and that's the first day of the soup. The second day of the soup is called ribolita because it's the minestrone recooked and what that does is it starts to thicken the third day they add a little bit of grain It's called minestra di farro and by the time you get to the last day or the fourth day sorry not the last day the fourth day what they'll do is they'll take it and they'll actually at this point it's become so thick because they've cooked it several times that they'll actually saute it in a little bit of a pan and it comes up looking more like kind of a porridgey thing than looking like a Mario, soup. Mario, yes. why can't you do that in one day? Why do you need five days? Well, you don't. You don't need the days. And in fact, I'm going to show you how we make this ribolita the first day. But that's just the way the dish had evolved originally. That it, they started out by making just plain old ordinary vegetable soup. And by the end of the day, you're making like these little cakes of something. Now, garlic is an issue in Italy. The further south they get, the more they like. In Tuscany, they like the flavor of it, but they don't like it too aggressive. So for this giant pot of soup, I'm actually just going to put in two cloves. So now at this point I'm starting with what's called sofrito, which is just root vegetables or aromatics cooked originally in the lipid of choice. What would your lipid of choice be, Mallory? Oh, wow. Extra virgin olive oil. Of course it would be, because you're totally Tuscan. The whole idea behind the sofrito is now you've created a base flavoring for anything at this point. And we're not going to use chicken stock or anything, we're just going to use water. And as long as we've paid attention to this and seasoned it along the way as we go, you're going to find that even a water-based soup is something miraculous. Now, there's going to be a couple of herbs, but one of the things that's really important to realize in Tuscan cooking is they like the scent of herbs, but they don't necessarily like too much about them. So we're going to throw in a whole thing of thyme and two bay leaves, but we're going to pick them out before we serve them. We would make sure that they never got into anyone's Mario, bowl. Are those fresh herbs? These are fresh herbs, fresh bay leaves. The fresh. When do you use the fresh herbs? You use the fresh herbs whenever you can get them. You use dried herbs when you're going to cook something for a very long time and you can't find the fresh herbs at the store. But you'd use a lot less. If you're going to use dry thyme, a half a teaspoon would make enough for all of that, which if I chopped that off would give me a couple tablespoons. Now I'm going to take some leeks. And then I'm going to take the main ingredient, the most important one, one that up until about three or four years ago was difficult to find. This is something called cavolo nero, or black cabbage. It's a cruciferous vegetable, a member of the broccoli and cabbage family. And if you can't find it, by all means, just go ahead and use collards or kale. Any deep kind of rich green is going to give you the flavor. This is slightly more bitter than a kale. So if you want to maybe add something bitter, like bad poetry or something to your soup, you'll do well with it. But why, they, couldn't, hmm? why couldn't you find 
this? Why was it Because it was grown in Italy, but not so much grown in America. Now it's being grown in America in a lot of places, but still, a lot of times it's hard to find some of these ingredients. We live in New York City, where you can find just about anything. If you can't find it, it doesn't exist pretty much in New York. Yeah. But throughout the rest of America, a lot of times it's harder to find some of these things. We want to make sure we season that just a little bit, and we're going to cook this. Now, there's going to be no al dente vegetables in the soup. It's going to be cooked until what we call it's totally Tuscan or hammered. We're going to take these beans and their cooking liquid. We're going to take some plain old ordinary boiling water, and we're going to bring that whole thing up to a boil. The cabbage is going to exude some of its liquid. When we come back, I'll show you how we serve it. Before we go, though, I want to just start a little bit of cabbage because we're going to make some interesting bracciole, which are these little pockets of veal or pork, whichever you prefer. We're going to take some cabbage, we're going to throw it into some boiling water and just cook it down until it's really soft. When we come back, I'll show you how to serve up the soup, drizzle with a little bit of oil, make a couple of fettunta, and get down with the pork bracciole. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Now to serve this magnificent soup, we serve, well, well, we lose one girl, but what we'll do is we'll serve it with something called fetunta. And we're gonna take a little bit of bruschetta, which are these beautiful pieces of bread, just kind of sanded with a little bit of garlic. So you get a nice amount of flavor, but you don't really like too much garlic in your food if you're in Tuscany, because who knows how much garlic your date has consumed. And if it's not exactly the same, then there's no love going on around the house. So now you take the soup and it's relatively thick and it's just almost like a big bowl of vegetables. And to finish it, you drizzle it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. What kind of bean is in there? Now these are called cannellini beans, which are kind of like the white great northern beans that America has, except they're a little bit longer. The Tuscans go wild for their bean varieties. Here you go, Caitlin. So they're always, there's, there's all kinds of different kinds of beans that they're excited about. And in the same sense that we have these kind of heirloom varietals of vegetables and tomatoes going on. Bon appetito, guys. Try it out. In the same sense that we have varietal uh, tomatoes with all these kind of interesting heirloom concepts going on, they do the same thing with their beans. Now, the next thing we're going to make are these little cabbage pockets that are going to be called kind of like braccioli, but they're not like the braccioli that you're familiar with in Naples because they're not going to be braised in a tomato sauce. How's the soup? It's delicious. Isn't it so simple? And it's just water. Wow. It's just water, ladies and gentlemen. Water. It's practically free. I love that. Mario, is this a winter soup? Uh, fall. fall. Fall and then into winter. They don't serve it. They actually would serve a ribolita like this in the summer sometimes with a different kind of cabbage, and they would serve it room temperature. Never cold, but room temperature would certainly be one of the ways they love to do it. Substitute for pasta? Or? This, well, it's, it's funny. The soup course, particularly one with beans or sometimes served with this bread, might even be the very first course that you serve. And then instead of having antipasto, you have this. And then instead of this kind of replaces antipasto and pasta. It's called a minestra. And it's the first thing you'll eat. And then you'll go have your, like your pork bracciole. Like what we're going to have today might be considered a regular kind of a Tuscan meal. That is to say, a lot of times they don't necessarily traditionally have pasta in their courses. They just go straight from something rich and stewy like this into their very simple meats. Tuscan food is often misconstrued in, in the American ideology by thinking that it's really elaborate. But one of the most important things about Tuscan food, I'm adding a few fennel seeds to these onions here that are going to become part of the cabbage that we're going to stuff these pork pockets with. But one of the things that is most surprising to many Americans when they get over there is the, the national dish of Tuscany, or the most famous dish of all of Tuscany is just grilled meats. They're famous for this steak called La Fiorentina, which is just this giant T-bone that they serve with spinach and olive oil. And it's really because in their world, the best thing they can do is accentuate the quality of some of their best products, which in Tuscany is either their olive oil or their olives or some of their wild game. There's these wild boars, so they're always hunting for them and shooting them up and serving them just plain roasted. Roasted or grilled meats are really a big thing in Tuscany. Now, this is the filling for our little pockets. We have some onions, we have a little fennel seed, we had parsley, salt, and the tiniest touch of chili flakes. And I'm just gonna cook that until it's kind of sweated down with the onion a little bit, but it doesn't need to really cook that through because we've already cooked the cabbage the entire time. So now the, the meat we're gonna take is a pork. You buy the pork loin, you can buy it from your butcher just like this. This is kind of like where the, the strip loin or the steak would be on a beef or the pork chop would be on a pig. 
and you just take pieces like this and your butcher can do that for you and he can actually or she actually pound it for you and all you want to do is just pound it out so that it becomes a tender thinner piece that we're eventually just going to stuff and this is something a lot of times when you read scallopini on a menu in Italy did I get you? No. I'm sorry I didn't pass out the safety goggles just duck if it comes at you but when you see scallopini on a menu in Tuscan and Emilia Romagna if you're worried about eating pork you'd have to ask them because sometimes scallopini doesn't necessarily mean veal it could be anything it could be pork it could be well it could be pork beef or veal for that matter so we pound them out until they're nice and thin and then let me make sure we pound this one out just a little bit more and although this is a very tender meat Pounding it into this thinner piece is going to make it have an entirely different texture than just tender. It's going to give it almost a kind of a chew at a certain point because we're going to cook it a little bit longer than we normally would. So to make these little pockets, we arrange our little pieces. We season them with a little bit of salt. It's important to season them on the inside because the filling and the inside of the meat is really going to be the bulk of what it tastes like. So you want to make sure you get that. seasoning those only with salt? That's yep, just salt. They, they, they only put pepper really on the top of stuff in Italy. They don't really season so aggressively like we do in America where we put salt and pepper on everything. So I'm going to take this cabbage. And in an ideal world, you would allow this to cool because it's easier to touch. But since we're cooking them right as we're making them, it's not even an issue for health or sanitation. You just want to get that right in there. One of the issues would be that if you had put hot stuff inside cold meat and then allowed it to sit, it would be in what's considered the danger zone of the temperature for food handling. And that's between 41 and 140 degrees. You want to make sure that food doesn't sit there very long because that's when bad things can happen. Nothing bad like bad food, just, you know, food poisoning is an issue. It could bother some people. So now we're going to fold these over like so. And because the cabbage is kind of whole, we don't necessarily have to make it stick too much. We're not going to try to sew it up. We're just going to put one toothpick in each one and two toothpicks in one. Can you imagine why that might be? Because the person who gets the one with two toothpicks has to wash the dishes. <laughs> so watch out when you're choosing carefully, but we're just going to choose it like that. We're going to adhere them both, and then we're going to cook them in, again, our lipid of choice. Mal? Extra virgin olive, olive oil, that's right. We're going to take them like so. I'm going to season them a little bit on the outside, and then we're just going to lay these little pockets in there. Virtually sauce-free, no big braising liquid. We're just going to allow the natural flavors of this stuff to sing quietly. When we come back, I'll show you how we finish these up. And then we're also going to make something called a budino, or a sformato of fagioli. Beans again? That's right, we're in Tuscany. See you in a few. not that excited about Contorno is taking some of these end of the summer fava beans. Fava beans, Hannibal Lecter aside, are delicious and not only served with somebody's liver and a nice glass of Chianti, but they're served just plain cleaned out like this. And they, they look like this when you get them in the store. You can buy them dried and they're equally interesting, but when you can get them fresh, one of the great things is to go ahead and just peel them like so. And often enough in Italy at the beginning of spring, they'll serve them just like that raw with a little bit of pecorino cheese. We've shucked a whole mess and we've boiled them here. Actually boiled them. We blanched them for about two minutes we cooked them because they don't need much cooking. And we're going to make something called a sformato or a budino of these favas. And what we're going to do is we're going to season the favas by taking a little bit of onion and a little bit of celery. What do you mean by bordino? Budino. Budino, budino translates into pudding. So this is kind of a bean pudding because of the texture. We're going to use some milk and some eggs and make it almost like a, I don't know, like a quiche kind of, but it's softer and it's much more fragrant, not as firm and certainly not French. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some of our 
extra virgin olive oil. We're going to throw a little bit of carrots and onions in here. And we're just going to serve to kind of soften that up. We're going to add a little bit of salt so that they can immediately start to soften up and give up their liquid. And then we're going to take these just blanched favas and we're going to toss them in there with that. And what that's going to do is going to add a little bit more depth of flavor to the fava beans themselves. Not to say that they're not enough, but we're looking for a little more structure. When you're talking about serving things with wine, which we're going to serve with this, plain favas would be good. But if we can jack up the flavor with a little bit more cooked vegetables and some cheese and some milk, you're going to see how cool this dish becomes. Mom, so how we're going do you to... choose favas? How do you choose them from the grocery store? When you go to the grocery store, you want to make sure that they're clean, that they're firm, that they look like they have some vitality. These are good. They're not drooping or anything. And in the spring, I like them very, very small. As it goes on to the end of the year, I just choose the smaller ones out of the batch. But the first ones that you'll see, they'll all come out about that big, which would have come out of one that was about as big as a big pea pod. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like the smaller ones, as, as small as you can get. But you, you realize that at the end of the year, they're not going to be that way. Now, to make this budino something very interesting, we're going to kind of create a slurry. And I have some more milk that's just coming to the boil a little bit of foam on it. What I'm going to do is create a slurry with just plain flour. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to add that back in there and I'm going to whisk it and then bring it back to a boil. What that's going to create is this thick pudding-like consistency that's going to kind of wrap around these beans here and make this really cool and interesting and soft. So I'm going to make sure that comes to a boil. In about three minutes, these beans would look like this. That is to say, they've lost that brighter color. They become almost a muted green, which we like. Tuscans don't ever eat their vegetables medium rare or al dente. They like them cooked all the way through. The trade-off that you have to do is understand that they're not going to be that bright green, like right out of all the fancy food magazines like Food and & Wine and Gourmet. They're going to look more muted and almost pastel -y, which is all right. We like that. So to these beans, which have cooled, we're going to add two eggs. We're going to add about a half cup of Parmigiano Reggiano, the indisputed king of cheeses. We're going to add a little parsley, and then we're going to add this milk that I just kind of stirred through with that roux. And what that's going to do is create this giant pudding-like thing that we're then going to cook in a bain-marie. Now, you cook in a bain-marie, which is a bagno maria in Italy, and they always wonder where that term came from. Well. I'm not quite certain, but they started using it around the 15th century after the Medici family started getting down and getting funky with all the cooking. Then they went up to France and brought their Italian cooks up with Caterina de' Medici when she married the French guy. And that's where the French learned how to cook. Does that mean bath? Yes, bath. Marie's bath. And I'll show you what it means. It means that because there's eggs in this dish, if we cook them in just a hot oven, if we just bake them like this, what would happen is they would puff up because they cook too quickly. So to slow that down, we put them in what's called the bagno maria, or a bain marie. Room temperature cool water. The stuff with the eggs in it, just kind of floating in there. Cover the whole thing with foil, and we're going to put it in a slow oven, 300 degrees, for an hour. And what you're going to see is we're going to get this ethereal pudding-like texture for the main reason, because we're cooking it slowly, but also because that water isn't allowing the heat to penetrate the eggs too quickly. When we come back, we'll plate the whole thing together. I'll show you how we finish the sauce with this veal, and we are going to be living Tuscany. <laughs> Welcome back. Now our veal's just about done. What we want to do is now arrange it in an artistic way on our little plate and create by finishing that wine sauce. All we need to do, because we've cooked the alcohol out of the wine, is just augment it with a little bit more of our favorite lipid, me and Mal. What is it, the one that we like to use here? Extra virgin olive oil. I'm going to allow that to just thicken a little bit at the very last second here. I'm going to drizzle a little bit of extra virgin olive oil in there and almost create something that's like a little broken vinaigrette. I'm going to have allowed this to cool just a little bit to the touch. Mario, what's a broken vinaigrette? A broken vinaigrette is a vinaigrette that's not emulsified. In America right now, the sauces aren't looking as thick as they used to maybe five or six years ago because we're kind of tired of that really thick, viscous mess. So then we just kind of break them and they look kind of a little funny and a little 
le less like they used to, but they're a lot funner to eat. And you'll see when I splash this over this at the last second there, it's going to look like little rivulets of oil have come out of it. Now we have our little sfumato here, or our budino. We have our pork. If I've said veal at all during the point, I meant to say that it was pork. I'm going to add a little cheese to that, and then right here, at the very last second, I'm going to add a little bit of parsley, a little bit of salt. Now, Mario, just, how just, do you know, you said you have to cook the pork for a while. How do you know how not to burn it? You just watch it very slowly, and it cooks on top of the oven, and it never gets burned. It won't burn. It'll overcook, you'll be able to tell that, but... It's just over time and working with me. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here. And I look forward to seeing you on the next Multimario. Ciao.